everyone, and welcome back to our webinar series where we will be discussing a number of topics that are related to medical cannabis. Uh, today, in our second episode, we are going to discuss access, uh, how to access a physician, how recreational legalization will affect you as a medical user, what to expect during a clinic visit, and the role of your licensed producer. Uh, now, just a reminder, we cover a different subject matter related to medical cannabis on every episode, and each episode will always end with a question and answer session. We also wanted to take this opportunity to thank those of you who are returning for this second episode for all of the great feedback that you've offered, uh, and we're definitely going to be incorporating some of your suggestions as we continue to move forward with this series. So just to let you know a little bit about myself, my name is Barb Vermeulen. I've worked in the legal cannabis system as a patient educator and advocate for several years. Uh, I've developed patient care service departments and policy for licensed producers, and currently I'm involved at the clinic level, uh, helping patients gain access and information and support on all topics that are related to medical cannabis. Uh, now today I am joined by my wonderful colleague and co-host Jonathan Warinsky, and I'll let him introduce himself to you all. <laughs> Thanks very much, Barb, and thank you all for joining us tonight for episode two in our series. So as Barb said, I'm Jonathan Warinsky. I lead up the cannabis counseling team at Canadian Cannabis Clinics. I joined CCC in 2014 and began initially by developing the counselor role. So I've counseled thousands of patients myself and I now serve as a subject matter expert. I was a registered massage therapist for 17 years, specializing in pain management, and I've studied cannabis for about 25 years. And now it's important again to note that myself, uh, Barb, uh, we're, as your host, we are not physicians. We are not providing specific medical advice during this webinar series, but as Barb said, we hope that there will be something for everyone joining us this evening, Barb. Okay, well, let's definitely get started. Uh, and I think uh, we'll start with the first question that's probably on everybody's mind, uh, and that is why go the medical route when when legalization for recreational users is, is coming. Uh, certainly there has been a lot of talk in the last year about the Canadian government's decision to legalize cannabis for recreational users. And, and here are the basics that you really need to know. Uh, so on October 17, 2018, purchasing and possessing recreational cannabis will be legal. Provinces have the right to set the minimum age, but it may not be lower than 18 years of age. Uh, now, each province has decided on its own distribution model. Uh, some provinces will allow over-the-counter sales by privately owned shops. Other provinces, including Ontario, are choosing to open stores that are overseen by provincial liquor control boards. Uh, now, there's also some provinces like British Columbia, and they're going to have um, a combination of both private and government-run retail locations. Uh, there's going to be online sales uh, via website, and mail delivery will also be available. There will also be some pharmacies that are distributing cannabis. And to start, uh, it looks like the products that will be available will be dried cannabis and edible oils. Uh, seeds and plants or clones are also being mentioned as potential products in the short term. Uh, one more additional point to this too is that individuals will also be permitted to grow up to four cannabis plants in their home. So to answer that very important question and really what we're going to discuss today, the three main motivators to maintain or let's say obtain a medical designation in this sort of post-legalization landscape are ongoing medical support, reduced cost, and guaranteed access. Um, and maybe, Jonathan, we can start off with medical support. Maybe you could um, uh, give a little information on that. For sure, Barb, thanks. So using cannabis medically is not the same as using recreational cannabis. At rec uh, recognized uh, cannabis clinics, patients are provided care under the supervision of a doctor who are expert and experienced in authorizing medical cannabis as a treatment modality. Um, which is something that you won't be uh, won't be available in provincial cannabis retail stores. Uh, it's important with all medical treatment to have regular follow up, so patients do have the ongoing support uh, at our at clinics with overall treatment plan. Uh, our counselors help patients choose the right type of cannabis product, register them with the licensed producer that has those products, and advise patients on how to use their products safely and in a cost effective manner. Now, the oversight of Health Canada provides strict quality assurance with third-party laboratory testing on all medical cannabis products. 
Uh, I think that's a really great point. And, and another um, concern that we often hear from uh, medical cannabis users is pricing. Uh, and, and really managing expenses, we know, um, can be extremely, extremely challenging when you're faced with a chronic illness uh, or disability or living on a reduced income. This is a conversation we have often with our patients. Uh, so as a medical user who is registered with a licensed producer, um, you may have access to what's called a compassionate pricing programs. These these programs basically offer reduced pricing for individuals with an income that is below a certain threshold. Now, a clinic such as Canadian Cannabis Clinics, Cannabis Rx, will educate you about the availability of these preferred pricing programs uh, for medical patients from licensed producer, and they'll help you access those programs. So really, really important. Um, insurance is another big one. Uh, insurers are increasingly developing policy regarding cannabis. Uh, policies with healthcare spending accounts which are quite common these days, can be used to cover the costs of medical cannabis. Uh, clinics, again, uh, such as uh, Canvas Rx, are now really advocating uh, for private payer coverage from the bigger insurers, uh, such as Desjardins, Great West Life, and Sun Life. Uh, so you do have some options there in terms of, of being able to afford your medication. Uh, last, and certainly not least, uh, you will also receive invoices with your orders, your medication orders, uh, from the licensed producers and these can be submitted with your annual income tax return uh, and thereby you may be eligible for a reduction in your taxable income. So really the bottom line is is that medical users should be paying less per gram on the whole uh, than a recreational user and, and of course this saves you money and that's that's really really important. Uh, now um, in terms of accessibility affordability is, is, is a big part of that um, but even just access as a whole maybe Jonathan you can speak to that as well. Absolutely. And as Canadians, when we're prescribed a medication by our doctor, we expect that that local pharmacy will have the medication, or at least they'll be able to get it to us quickly, should it not be in stock. Um, but it's, it's the same with medical cannabis. However, as many patients in Canada know, there have been concerns with products being consistently available for many licensed producers over the years. It's important to end the comparison with pharmacies there, because with cannabis, uh, medicine, uh, the plants must be developed and grown, harvested, cured, and then packaged, ready for sale. And given that this industry is new, certainly compared to the pharmaceutical system in Canada we have, cannabis production requires time to catch up in terms of having enough supply to meet demand. Now, with legal adult recreational use coming in October, patients want to know that they will have reliable access to the products that are working for them. Licensed producers have gone on record and made commitments to clinics and medical patients that they will offer priority access and reduce pricing to medical patients. There's even been an announcement from one major licensed producer that they will be absorbing the government's excise tax on medical cannabis. Um, That's amazing or, news. That's mm -hmm. definitely amazing news. It's, it's really interesting because the licensed producers really have adopted this patient's first policy. It's something that we're hearing time and time again. Um, yeah. What's very, very interesting as well is that I was fortunate enough to uh, start uh, working in this new revised, let's say, medical cannabis system, uh, and it's now five years old. Um, and I was um, uh, fortunate to be at one of the first Canadian LP um, facilities and watched it get built. Uh, and that was a 60,000 square foot facility that had an annual harvest capacity of about, I would say, 5,000 kilograms. Um, what's fascinating now is that licensed producers are now running and building facilities that are literally a million square feet in and size more. Yeah. Uh, and more uh, and, and building very, very quickly. Uh, many of them also, too, are already in production. Uh, and these facilities are literally capable of exceeding over 100,000 kilograms of production annually. Uh, also, to it to consider is, is that over time, uh, they've refined their growing processes in these facilities uh, to very um, significantly increase their yields. So they are really, really actively working towards meeting that patient demand. Uh, so again, really, as a medical patient, uh, you will get priority over recreational consumers. Uh, and again, that patient's first policy is, is so, so important. So, so now that we've clarified how recreational legalization affects a medical user uh, and the benefits of a medical designation, Jonathan, perhaps you can speak to something that often presents a challenge to people who, who wish to use medical cannabis, uh, and that is finding a doctor who is able and willing to prescribe. Yes, and well, first off, cannabis is not prescribed per se. It is authorized with what is called a medical document by a physician. This authorizes the patient to purchase and use medical cannabis from a licensed producer. 
Some physicians prefer their patients are seen by physicians who are expert in medical cannabis, which is exactly why visiting a recognized cannabis clinic is a preferable option for those seeking medical cannabis and the support with how to use it, again, safely and economically. And some physicians choose not to authorize the use of cannabis as medicine. So that leads us actually getting an appointment in a cannabis clinic. So access to uh, medical cannabis via a clinic begins with a simple referral. Patients can ask their doctor to refer them to a doctor specializing in accessing suitability for medical cannabis as therapy. A medical cannabis clinic will need some notes from your doctor on your condition or the symptoms you're dealing with. And if your doctor is not on board with you using medical cannabis, you still have the right to ask for copies of the notes from your chart uh, to submit with what's called a self-referral. So in the case of Canadian cannabis clinics, it's as easy as visiting our website, submitting a one-page form by fax or email uh, to get the process started. And once we receive your medical chart, we're able to book you an appointment at one of our many conveniently located clinics, um, a process that usually happens within a week or two, depending on just how quickly uh, their GP gets the information to us, Barb. Absolutely. And I'm, I'm really glad, Jonathan, that you mentioned the self-referral option, uh, because I think a lot of patients, when they hit that barrier um, with, their, with their regular physician, sort of feel like they are out of options. Uh, mm. But again, the self-referral route is, is certainly one that you can take. Uh, so maybe you can describe for us, Jonathan, what a patient will experience. Uh, maybe walk us through what to expect when you uh, visit a clinic. Absolutely. So at Canadian Cannabis Clinics, patients are provided really with a very unique and highly individual, uh, individualized healthcare experience. First-time visitors are sometimes surprised that the cannabis clinic setting is exactly like any other doctor's office that you would visit. Very professional. We get that a lot. We <laughs> Most do. people are so surprised that it is really exactly like a doctor's office. And, because and, and, it is. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, upon arriving to the clinic, patients are welcomed by our reception staff, a comfortable seating area. Um, so first, a patient is going to be seen by what we call as a physician assistant. Um, this physician assistant will perform a brief medical assessment, uh, and then you'll be seen by the physician, who again is expert in cannabinoid medicine for a thorough consultation. And after discussing symptoms and treatment options and a treatment plan, uh, at CCC, we generally start our patients with a, a shorter term um, medical document at first, usually about three months, and this gives ample time for you, the patient, to start the medication, get used to the, uh, you, using it to address your specific needs, and making notes on your progress. Journaling, journaling, journaling can't be uh, emphasized enough. So if changes do need to be made to a medical document, those adjustments are generally made at the first follow-up appointment, again, around the three-month mark. So after you've met with the doctor uh, and cannabis use has been authorized, you then have an opportunity to visit with the cannabis counselor. And the counselor will review your medical document and offer guidance on what products to select and how to use them. Um, the, uh, given the information on how to access continued support from the clinic um, is, is the 360 degree care that we provide. So in Absolutely. between appointments, our, 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 our patients have access to our in-house counselors for any questions and concerns they have before they come back for follow-up. Exactly. Um, and, you know, again, the, the role of the counselor really important because you do get that support, you get that extra information that you're looking for. Uh, and again, the assistance with registering and choosing the, the licensed provider from which you're going to buy your medication. And, and this is where um, patients sometimes get a little confused with how the system works. Mm -hmm. We touched on the role of a licensed producer in our first episode. And just to recap, uh, a licensed producer is a company that is licensed by Health Canada to grow and package and sell cannabis to medical Medical patients. Uh, now, as Jonathan just explained, during your clinic visit, you'll be issued a medical document by the physician. Now, under this system that's been designed by Health Canada, patients then choose the licensed producers from which they will buy their medication. And again, this is why taking an advantage of, of working with a cannabis counselor at a clinic is so, so valuable uh, because they're really able to help you make this important decision, complete the necessary paperwork, and then forward it to the licensed producers on your behalf. Uh, so at the end, of your clinic uh, visit, the medical document and your standard registration form, about two pages long, is uh, forwarded to the licensed producer of your choice. Now, at this point, your registration then transfers and it is in the hands of the licensed producer you've chosen. Uh, they are going to take the following steps. Uh, they're going to review your medical document and application. Uh, they must verify your medical document with the physician and then they will create a customer account for you at their website. Uh, now, during this process, you should be contacted 
contacted by the licensed producer directly. Uh, you should either get an, a welcome email or letter from them or phone call letting you know that your documents have been received and are being processed. Uh, now processing of documents usually takes anywhere from about five to ten business days. Uh, so once your documents have been processed, uh, you will then receive a follow-up communication from your licensed producer, uh, letting you know that your registration has been completed. And at this point, you'll be provided with a unique account number and instructions on how to log into your new account at the licensed producer's website to place orders for your medication. Uh, it looks a lot like if you've ever shopped on Amazon or done any online shopping, uh, your online account looks very, very similar to uh, looks very, very similar to that. Now, if you prefer not to use email or shop online, that is totally okay. Uh, you will be provided with your licensed producer's uh, phone number, so certainly you can reach out to them by phone uh, with any questions, uh, and they will also um, uh, contact you by phone and regular post as well. The, the process is really, really straightforward. Basically, it just comes down to visiting a clinic, obtaining your medical document, forwarding it to a licensed producer for registration, and then ordering your medication directly from your licensed producer. Bada bing, bada boom. Exactly. So maybe, Jonathan, now you can take us through, what's, how do you place an order? What's, yeah. what's, how does that work? Right. So once a patient is fully registered, you can log on to your account using the information provided by the licensed producer and order the medication online or simply phone them to do so. It really is very easy, as Barb just emphasized, to place an order with an LP, whether it is online or over the phone. Your order details are made very clear during the ordering processes. If you're calling in, the agent will go over all the same points with the patient to ensure the entire order is correct, including um, the quantity, the shipping address, the shipping method. It's also important to order conservatively to start, as Barb was talking, about, talking before we got on air. Regardless of which product is going to be used, just start with a very small amount for the first order to determine if it helps. It's usually a five gram. Five, five gram is the minimum. That for sure, for dried, for dried product yeah. or maybe one bottle of oil. Exactly, or oil one bottle of oil. Yeah. yeah, but we want to minimize the expense, the initial outlay until we get, you know, determining how this is going to work for any given uh, patient. Um, but customer care teams at licensed producers are very knowledgeable when it comes to the products they sell, so they will also be able to give expert guidance should you need it. And again, um, that is available by phone or email. So each licensed producer is a little different with policies, of course, but once an order is received by the LP, it's usually shipped the same day or the next business day. And you'll receive a tracking number uh, for every order, so you'll always know when it's scheduled to arrive. And medication is delivered to your door. It will require the signature of an adult upon delivery. Most packages arrive within about two to five days after they're ordered, um, give or take. And these packages are very discreet, plainly packaged, no visible brand names, and there's absolutely no smell of cannabis because products inside are vacuum sealed. So your medication comes in these sealed containers with your name, doctor information, product information, all clearly labeled, uh, as well as a receipt for the order. And you will also have documentation from the licensed producer in the form of a welcome letter or an ID card to serve as your legal documentation, Barb. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's funny because the, the mail order system, uh, um, you know, and, and I will freely say that, that I'm a patient as well, uh, and I'm a big fan of, of the mail order system for a number of reasons. Again, because Jonathan and I, we work in the clinic, um, certainly we see a lot of individuals who may be mobility challenged, um, uh, individuals where um, simply just going to a store or, or going out for their medication is not an option. Uh, and again, there is um, a certain, a, a very large degree of, of discretion. Um, because again, we know that we still deal with stigma issues. Uh, and, and so to have your medication delivered to your home directly to you uh, is really a benefit. Um, it, it really is a benefit. And certainly we've worked with a lot of patients uh, who are very grateful to have that option. Yeah. Uh, and it, it works very, very well. So uh, right, yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm always surprised at, with the number of packages that licensed producers actually ship out on a daily basis, which is massive, uh, that um, uh, the system actually works. And, and, and again, most patients do get their, um, uh, get their medication regardless of where their licensed producer is. Uh, you can live Very in Ontario uh, and have a licensed producer that's based out of, out of Vancouver or based out of the East Coast. Mm -hmm. um, because the postal system works so well, again, usually within two to five business days 
from ordering. So uh, that's, um, uh, that's basically how that works. Uh, so now that you have kind of the nuts and bolts, hopefully, of how this system works and how to obtain ac access to your medication, um, you know, um, let's uh, maybe uh, talk about um, uh, some questions that yeah. uh, you may have. Uh, so let's see. Today we are taking questions both uh, live from the chat uh, and also, too, we've got some coming in here. And all is to just remember, if we don't get to your question during the webinar, uh, you'll be receiving receiving an email with a response from our help team. So if you've added it in chat and you didn't get an answer, don't worry. Uh, and also too, if something comes to mind after the webcast, please do feel free to reach out to webinar at canvasrx.com with any further questions. Uh, so uh, let's, let's get started. All right. Before we get into questions, I'm just going to extend a big thanks to our entire technical team here for bringing this whole production. <laughs> you guys uh, are amazing. <laughs> production to, uh, to fruition tonight. We've got a great team and uh, we're pulling off pretty well. So let's jump into some questions. Can we take the first one, Barb? Yes, please do. So the first one I see here, what forms of legal documentation can I use? So presumably we're talking about if asked by an authority to present um, uh, your legal documentation status uh, for having cannabis on your person. When you have cannabis from a licensed producer, you have a, a card or a welcome letter uh, with, uh, when used in combination with photo issued government ID, that serves as your legal documentation. Each licensed producer has their own policy on this. Some use the welcome letter, some use this little card. Uh, but you have to make sure you know which, which one is which because they're not sort of uh, trans transferable. Um, now also, any label on any um, cannabis product that you have purchased has the same documentation on it. So that too, combined with photo uh, issued government ID, uh, stands as a combination for legal exactly. status. Exactly. And I'm just going to interject here quickly as Please. well. Um, when we were talking about um, the clinic experience and how patients are often surprised at how mm -hmm. you know, legitimate and medical it is, when you receive your medication, from your licensed producer, uh, the containers that you receive your 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 medication in, uh, it comes either clearly labeled each time or with new stickers that you can affix that has your doctor's information, right. your information, uh, your daily dosage. So it, it really has all of that information. Which again, when you do present that to someone in law enforcement, uh, it is very legitimate looking yeah. documentation. Uh, so you can feel very confident uh, in that regard that that you're covered. Yeah. Okay, I think that got, that has that one. Okay, great. Well, and uh, interesting that I, I mentioned covered because our next question actually um, speaks to there you insurance go. coverage. Yeah. So there's a nice little segue for us. Uh, so someone has written in and they've asked, why don't insurers cover all costs of medical cannabis right now? Uh, and I think that is a wonderful question and a very, very important one. Um, and it comes down to um, uh, one sort of technicality, uh, and that is what is called a DIN number, a drug identification number. Uh, any medical product, any any pharmaceutical product is issued by Health Canada what is called a drug identification number. Um, and cannabis to date, unfortunately, has not been granted that yet. Uh, now, uh, there are a lot of reasons as to why not. Um, we suspect and, and know that with now more acceptance of cannabis as medicine, uh, there are more ongoing studies and, and clinical research into the benefits medicinally and medically of And that's of helping cannabis. the Insurance Alliance of Canada make and these decisions. Exactly, exactly. So I would not be surprised to see a DIN number coming down the road. Um, now, what is very exciting uh, is that um, uh, certainly there have been some individuals uh, who have done some great advocacy. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a gentleman named Jonathan Zaid who comes to mind, uh, a young man who um, basically made a challenge to his insurance company and was able to have his and cannabis what? covered as a medical expense. And this now sets precedent for a number of other patients. Uh, and so you're starting to see the dominoes fall. Um, doors opening. Exactly, and doors opening. Uh, and again, as I mentioned previously, if you do have private payer coverage with um, uh, any of the larger insurance companies, uh, we tell patients, um, be the squeaky wheel, contact them, let them know what you are, are entitled to. Let them know that you're a medical cannabis user and that you are interested in coverage. Um, also too, um, the healthcare spending account. Most, um, most policies these days do have a certain set amount of money uh, set aside that you can then designate for certain things like massage therapy, like um, uh, um, like uh, visiting with a psychotherapist, anything like that. And, and people are successfully using their healthcare spending accounts uh, to help afford their medication. So, so very, very important. Uh, but again, uh, things are changing so, so rapidly. I certainly would not be surprised to see um, more uh, private coverage coming in, 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 uh, in months to come. I can see Canada really defining that as we move forward. 
Exactly. Well, Canada really is defining a lot. everything in yeah. terms of, of policy, uh, in terms of product, uh, and in terms of distribution across the world. Canada sure. really is the blueprint, and we yeah. are at the forefront of this uh, amazing um, new um, technology and this amazing new medical advances. Yeah. Uh, and that's something to really be proud of, uh, yeah. I think. I think, absolutely. Let's jump on to the next one, Barb. Yeah. I got one here that says, what will happen to medical dispensaries when cannabis is legalized? And I'm just going to jump on that one succinctly to say, medical dispensary. I understand there are some people who frequent dispensaries will feel that they're getting their medicine from them, but it's a completely un un unregulated environment, so you don't really know what products you're getting, and that's just a fact. Uh, so what will happen to dispensaries when cannabis is legalized? Well, um, according to the new laws that are coming in under the Cannabis Act, there are going to be extraordinarily high fines. There's going to be very lengthy jail sentences for people who are operating illegally in cannabis trade. So I think that uh, many will not be able to remain open uh, or they will shift their businesses over to legal environments. Exactly, exactly. And, and certainly we know um, that, that dispensaries have been very popular. Um, and, and what's interesting is that the dispensary culture originally started within the medical community, um, but certainly the recreational community did sort of take that dispensary model and, and run with it. Uh, you know, and so again, um, you know, when we're talking about cannabis as medicine uh, and really following a treatment plan with, with standardized medication uh, that is stuff. clearly labeled and regulated, yeah. um, unfortunately, um, dispensaries, uh, black market, gray market, they, they do not offer that quality assurance. Uh, and, and while there may be people who work at dispensaries that, that are very knowledgeable, when it comes to um, you know, speaking about cannabis in a purely medical context uh, in, in the form of a, a treatment plan, uh, I think that um, it, it, it probably is, is preferable that you would obtain your medication um, from, a, let's say, a licensed producer rather than a dispensary. Okay. That's going to bring us on to the next one I've just see popped up here. The information package I received with my order said that cannabis can be addictive for some people. Um, so there can be um, there can be a situation with cannabis use known as cannabis use disorder. That's right. And there are different interpretations of addiction around cannabis use. This would definitely be a question best answered by a physician. Um, but the question essentially is, can I become addicted to cannabis? Well, you can be addicted to a lot of different things, but what capacity? Is it physical? Is it, is it chemical addiction? Is it mental, emotional ad addiction? And again, Barb and I are not physicians, so it's not for us to tease those things apart, but um, cannabis can present problems for some people. It's a pretty rare group, but uh, it can be a, a problematic um, medical it, situation that needs treatment. It can, and conversely, absolutely. as you led to earlier, many people will use canva, cannabis uh, medication as a segue to get out of other substance abuse issues. Well, and, and this is where cannabis really is um, a very complex uh, and very interesting, mm -hmm. um, uh, it's a very interesting topic to broach. I read a very interesting article in the um, National Post over the weekend uh, about a young gentleman who uh, was entering rehab for essentially cannabis addiction. Mm -hmm. uh, what was interesting is that in that article um, they did mention, and he even he mentioned that um, he had um, issues with um, with other substances as well. Uh, and it's funny because cannabis has always sort of been flagged as, as sort of a gateway drug, mm -hmm. as I make air quotes here, but you can't yeah. see. Yeah. Um, and and what's interesting is that many researchers um, have stated that they actually feel that that tobacco uh, and is, alcohol. is and alcohol are considered um, uh, more um, risky in terms of what would be considered a gateway drug. Yeah. Um, what's also very fascinating, as you alluded to earlier, earlier as well, is that uh, certainly we are facing right now in Canada, in North America, um, uh, some very big issues with regards to the use of opiates uh, and the misuse of opiates. Uh, and also to, um, certainly I know you've spoken with patients and I've spoken with patients who have perhaps found themselves locked in this cycle where um, they, they have opiates as their only option. Mm -hmm, yeah. uh, they don't want that. Uh, they want alternatives. Uh, and so we're looking at, um, and many doctors and many addiction specialists are, are starting to look at the use of cannabis uh, as a harm reduction mm -hmm. um, mechanism mm -hmm. where uh, a 
someone who is um, having an issue with opiate dependency can actually use cannabis to help uh, taper off uh, and taper down um, and, and lower those amounts of opiates that they've been using. And certainly in some cases with patients that I've spoken to, uh, they have actually been able to um, leave their opiates Absolutely. behind. And other, is, and other drugs. And other drugs as well too. Yeah. Um, again, you know, we will, we will sort of couch that statement in, in saying that, that cannabis, again, it is not a cure-all, um, but it is, certainly is useful in addressing a, a number of symptoms, uh, and certainly addiction and, and um, uh, is, is a big one. Uh, I also had, and, and you'll often hear me in these webinars sort of recall anecdotes from patients, because really this is what it's all about. Uh, and, and one of my patients um, really mentioned to me that, that when they used cannabis, um, it, it's, it, it the addiction doesn't come from, from the cannabis itself. Yeah. She, she said to me, she said, I'm addicted to not being in pain. Um, and, and that I thought was a really great way to sort of look at that. It puts um, it in context, doesn't it? Look at that context, mm -hmm. exactly. You know, so, so very important. And, and again, we know, um, you know, especially with legalization coming, there are some grave, grave concerns that many people have, especially those who, who aren't educated um, in, in, in cannabis and, and are as familiar with it as we are. And, and this is exactly why we want to present this information for you all, uh, because we feel that the more information people have, the less stigma um, we're going to be dealing with moving forward. So uh, hopefully that's touched on that. Now I've got another question here, uh, and um, actually, you know what? I um, oh, I guess I'm, I'll take this question too. So one of our um, uh, one of our, our uh, patients has written in. She says, "I've been taking cannabis for about a month and a half, and I have been having some relief for some of my symptoms, uh, but migraines." And and nausea are still constant even at my maximum dosage. Uh, my next clinic appointment isn't until mid-August, so should I make an earlier appointment to reassess my prescription? Uh, which is a great question, and thank you so much for, for, for bringing that in. Um, the short answer to this is yes. Absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, and, and again, um, there, there is, um, there's a few things to say around that. Yeah. Um, now, it, what's interesting is that um, the person asking this question, uh, it's been about six weeks, a month and a half, uh, and that is what I always like to say with new patients is that there will always be what I like to call a period of investigation, mm -hmm. uh, where you are establishing dosages, mm -hmm. where you are figuring out what are the best products for me to use, how much, and when to use them. And here we go, guys, you're gonna hear me talk about journaling. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. so, so important um, to, to really make a note when you're starting this, uh, this journey, um, to really um, note how you're feeling in terms of symptom management before you take your medication uh, and after your medication. Um, you know, I tell people, um, write down how much and what you took, uh, note what you felt like, how your symptoms felt beforehand, uh, how they feel a half an hour later, how they feel an hour later, two hours later, three hours later, and four hours later. And what should happen again is that that picture will emerge of what is working and what is not. The other great thing about journaling then is that you will have a record of, of what you've taken and what you've done so that when you do come in for your follow-up, you can then show the doctor and say, okay, this is what I've been taking, this is what's working, this is what's not working. And then the physician can really make some, some good decisions and guide you in the right direction uh, so that hopefully you get all of those symptoms uh, taken care of. So yes, absolutely. If you've sort of hit that, if you've been journaling and you've hit that sort of four, five week period, six week period, and you feel like you would like a little more guidance, uh, certainly A, reach out to our counseling team. Uh, and B, um, certainly you can definitely call and, and ask for a, um, an earlier appointment to come in and speak to the physician. Yeah. All righty. So Should we take one more? I think we've got time for, how much time have we got left here? We've got a few minutes left, so yeah, let's, uh, let's take the last question, Jonathan. Okay, I see this one here. Is it possible to ever overdose with this oil? So obviously there are a wide variety of different cannabis oils out there with different concentrations of different cannabinoids, THC, as we've discussed earlier, CBD. Um, so... Essentially, the answer in a word is yes, but one can experience an adverse reaction to a cannabis product by using too large a dose. Generally speaking, when someone uses too great a dose of a THC oil, they may feel unwell, or really quite unwell even, for a few hours, but for most people this passes without really lasting effects. Um, most people who experience an adverse reaction know what caused it, and they won't repeat it. 
However, some very serious concerns can arise when using a large dose of a THC oil. So this too is important to discuss with a physician. We will be going into much more detail on this in our episode on THC, so definitely stay tuned for that one. Yeah, definitely do stay tuned for that. Um, you know, and again, we do have a lot of plans with the topics that we uh, plan on addressing. Uh, and, and again, you know, certainly again, because Jonathan and I have been supporting patients for quite a long time, um, adverse reactions happen. Uh, they do happen with any um, pharmaceutical that you may take. Uh, certainly, again, as Jonathan mentioned, um, uh, the, the risk with a THC product uh, generally is going to be much higher uh, than with a CBD product. Uh, and so, again, uh, we will be discussing um, very specifically going into the specifics of THC, what it does, how it works, and, and at that point again we will address the, um, uh, the possible contraindications or issues that a patient might run into. And how to prevent them. And how to prevent them, absolutely, because yeah. it is certainly preventable. Uh, and again, what it does come down to is, is the Canadian Cannabis Clinic's mantra, which is always start low and go slow. What's that um, mantra again? <laughs> start low <laughs> and go slow. Yeah. Uh, because again, um, when you're starting a new medication, you're, you're best option is to use the least amount uh, possible to begin with and journal and titrate upwards until you find that that sort of sweet spot uh, as we call it of, of, of the right product and the right amount uh, so that you can avoid any any unpleasant effects uh, but again and unnecessary cost and unnecessary right? cost very economical um, exactly and and it's very important to note too that that in in all of the um, uh, history of, of, of people using cannabis medicinally um, that they're uh, over Overdose, uh, death due to overdose is um, Physical uh, impossible. physically impossible. Uh, so, so that's really something to, uh, to note um, that's very, very important. So I think that is going to bring us very close to the conclusion of this episode. Uh, and I do thank you again so, so much for joining us. I hope that you uh, enjoyed this presentation because we certainly do enjoy bringing you this information. Uh, remember as well, please, you can always reach out to webinar at canvasrx.com with any questions that you have. Uh, again, if we did not get to your question today and you sent it in via the chat, uh, don't worry, one of, our, uh, one of our people will be contacting you. Uh, and feel free again to follow up uh, at webinar at canvasrx.com with, with any of those questions because we love them. Uh, also too, we've had a lot of requests about whether or not this will be available uh, to you to revisit. Uh, mm -hmm. And yes, we have a YouTube channel, which one of our tech guys has set up. Uh, we definitely um, would uh, advise you to to, uh, go to YouTube. I think you'll probably be getting a link. Maybe we could be getting a link to that. I'm getting a nod. <laughs> I'm getting a quiet nod here. Uh, and then you can subscribe and then you will automatically have access to each episode that we do. Uh, and, and again, it's important because we know we're giving you a lot of information here uh, and, and, uh, and it's, it's good to review. So um, please, again, our next episode is going to be on July 25th. Uh, that's going to be a Wednesday at 730 uh, EST, Toronto time. And uh, we will be talking about CBD uh, or cannabidiol. So getting into um, a real depth with that, Jonathan and I. Uh, thank you again, everyone. It's been such a pleasure uh, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks so much for joining us and again, thanks to our production team. Way to go, guys. Take care, everyone. See you in a few weeks, all. Bye-bye.